fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Nerd on Kingston. 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. Of course, I'm Al Warren, and the boxer is here, Mr. Joe, <laughs> Joe Martino. <laughs> Joe sounds like a more of a boxer, boxer name, yeah. doesn't it? You know, yeah. like, rather than Dave. Dave is like a thought-out name. Yeah. Like you, you can't be Karate Dave. You can't yeah, be. Yeah, I guess not. Well, you know what I'm saying. Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, Kung Fu yeah. wouldn't have a Dave. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. so you got to come up with a good name. Okay. Joe's a boxer name. So that doesn't yeah, it's true. work. Uh, you know, you can think of Joe. I do a little Joe. boxing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just have to work around the midsection. Isn't that what the comment is? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm working on it, Al. What are, you, are you fat shaming me? I'm fat shaming you, buddy. No. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I couldn't imagine, right? I couldn't imagine why anybody would even say that. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to see if he's wearing underwear or not. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> Man. Always commando. Always commando. Well, That's he doesn't right. have to worry about any <laughs> <laughs> This is terrible. What a terrible yeah. you what a terrible show you do. Horrible. Horrible. Anyway, <laughs> let's not let's not talk about the bad news. Let's just talk about the good stuff. Yeah. So now uh, we've got another Australian this week. So this is the week from the down under. I know. Right. But this guy's different than the last one we had. <laughs> quite, quite a bit different. I mean, they're, well, no, I'm not even going to go there. But now he is a horror author. Okay. So he's he's there to scare people. Um, mm -hmm. So Mr. Zachary Ashford is here. So thanks for being here, Zach. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really flattered, so thank you. We'll see if you say that later. <laughs> well, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Might not like it. Um, okay, so so Zach asked for it. When did you start writing? Okay, so um, I think 2018 I saw my first short story, and then by 2020 I had a novella. So I've, I've only had a few novellas, and I think two, three, fourth novella is the one that's just coming out. Um, I've got a couple of shorter stories um, through like a, a novelette and then a, a sort of duology of two short stories. And then later this year, I'll have my first novel come out. You're primarily a short story guy. It's interesting because I think if you consider a novella a short story, then yes, so far. I, I, I tend to sort of beat myself up a little bit for not actually writing too many actual short stories because I see the submission calls and things. And I think, oh, what do I do with that once I've done it? You know, put it aside for a collection somewhere. So basically written the novellas is, has been my primary objective over the last few years, and apart from the one novel I've written. And now I'm trying to write another one. And so getting reasonably far into that. So that's, that's where I see myself. Um, I probably should write more short fiction because I think it's probably a pretty effective way to get your name out there a little bit more. The concept, when you're writing horror, in your mind, are you trying to terrify people? Or are you more suspenseful? Or are you kind of more of a gore horror? Like, how, how, what would someone get out of one of your stories? Yeah, so I've, I've been sort of thinking about this. And um, look, I'm not going to lie, I do love blood and guts. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I love a good story. You'll, you'll like Dave's videos. You should go to his YouTube channel. Oh, no, nice. I'll check it out. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think like, it's interesting because I don't think I'm super gory. I think this novella is probably the first time I've actually done something that people would say, "Oh, you know, that's that's pretty close to that splatter or extreme side of things." I just I've, even when I sort of read fantasy as a teenager, lots of fantasy, I always loved it. You know, where heads were coming off and there were lots of battles and 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 these kinds of really over the top kinds of things, which is which is hilarious because listening to you guys talk about um. Boxes, names and stuff before, I'm just like, man, people who like train for fighting, they scare me because <laughs> I'm such a teddy bear, you know. But, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I just, I just love that kind of, kind of stuff in my horror. And when I'm watching a horror movie and there's some good blood and guts, I'm like, 
Oh, this is great. Um, but I think creature features is, is probably, I assume, and, you know, that's probably, I love a good monster in, in, in my fiction. Um, and so I try to write with monsters and I guess maybe even like the, the blending between how like there's the monstrous and humanity and that kind of thing. So yeah, I've sort of, I've written a dystopian horror. I've written, um, some comedic stuff with the, the, the drop bear horror, which they're, they're pretty gory, but it's comedic gore. Um, but this one is the first one that is sort of finishing. Oh, okay. It's pretty nasty, that book, you know, so I'm really waffling mm. my apologies. <laughs> yeah. No, that's all right. That's all right. We're discovering. We'll figure you out and then we'll know. We'll send you on your way. We'll figure out how, what you should be doing that. Yeah. Well, any, any pointers would be good. Well, and so you're writing a, mon- a monster in your horror. And obviously it's, it's traditionally for you, not a human, right? It's, it's, it's a creature of some sort. Yeah. Yeah, I do um, love a creature feature. So, so where does that come from? Like, where, and how do you how do you make a monster? Like, how did I've I've never done that. Like, I've always written myself stories about people or with people or crime. Like, there's something going on when you're writing a a, a monster. Um, I see because I'm trying to figure this out because do you or do you write because the monster's got to do something or scare people or it's got to represent something bad about humans. Yeah. You know, there's got to be some sort of thing. So do you come up with that monster first and then put characters in to deal with the monster uh-huh. or do you have a story? Ye- yes and no. Yes and no. I have a story. So I'll, I'll talk the, the morass. Um, like it's really because the morass kind of started off as a, as a monster free story. And um, it was kind of this really derivative little short story I wrote that was just, you know, the trope of the the Wolf Creek style murderer in, in Australia, you know, the outback highway patrolling guy who takes a backpacker and just does horrible things to them. And, and you know, it was fun, but what, and I was like, okay, so why, why is this guy doing this, you know? And then I was like, oh, what if we could bring in some, you know, he's actually in in, in the liege or service of, you know, there's some kind of monstrous deity that, you know, actually has these goals and it's, you know, it's sort of this cosmic monster and it's, it's wanting him to do something for it, you know, and say so that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I do typically like to think of monsters as being representative of something. Um, even if I go back to the, the soul survivor books, the drop bear books, I think it, it, they're, they're really over the top and silly. But what I really wanted to do with those is when you look at things like reality television and the, the lack of ethics really that comes from the producers and things like that in terms of they will put these people through anything. They will, they will absolutely position them and represent them as these horrendous people. And then they walk away and just go, cool. Yeah. Well, there's no, there's no mental health support for you. We're not doing any of that. We've just made you look like this. And and the, the suicide rate amongst reality TV stars is like disgustingly large. Even a few years ago, I was having a look because um, we were we were doing. I'm a teacher. We were doing some um, reality TV studies in class, and and how they position people. Um, and there was even at that point a few years ago, there was like something like 32 reality TV people had had gone off from the show afterwards and and actually committed suicide, which is like horrible and, and i know some countries have laws about the the services that have to be offered after that now but yeah. i thought to myself and well imagine if you know we could play with some of the genetic engineering aspects of creature features that are fun and and they use these in in this reality tv show so there's that um you, that sort of commentary there um we yeah. have quite a few people that do that uh commit suicide after being on the show <laughs> <laughs> well i hope i'm not one of those and there's just so much to do still so yeah <laughs> well you know we tend to bring that out in people and i'm not sure what we can do about it but... <laughs> oh well yeah i don't know <laughs> let's just have fingers but yeah reality reality tv's never been one i've never been a fan i don't I don't care for it. A lot of it's scripted. A lot of people go through. Yeah. You know, they're, they're just being used for a object to be, you know, laughed at or, yeah. you know, and it's just, it's not really my style. No, it's, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? We, we, we'll try and get these people to act in their worst possible way, edit all the bits out of it that make them seem in any way redeemable and then put them in front of the television, you know, for the whole world to see. So it's an interesting concept, but. I get why people get people yeah. to watch it as well. That whole trash fire of just you know the drama and and those yeah. things that are there. So, but yeah, no. So coming back to yeah. monsters, I, I just I do like to use them in in a way that they're bigger than just okay. Yeah, there's a monster roaming around. What are we going to do about it? You know, I think that's that's sort of really one dimensional. Um, right. So I do like to consider what else can be done um, with them, how they can be used, and even. Um, you know, just even even you take a creature like the shark or the crocodile, you can, you can say a lot about 
the environment or, or society or whatever with it. And I think that's just something really, really interesting that we're able to do with monsters. And I just like yeah. doing it for that reason. So Yeah, I can see that too, because not only that, when you have a monster and the monster is representing something bad or makes the reader aware of the bad part of humanity in a sense that's kind of exciting because you're not really putting that all on a person it's on a monster so it's kind of nice i i kind of like this idea yeah maybe i'll write one of these yeah i I find them good fun and plus you get the whole joy of thinking about you know what well what's my monster capable of you know is it does it have horns or wings or tentacles or or whatever it is you know so yeah it's always good fun and so you but but so the characters that you put in hmm. kind of that are up against the creature or the monster of the time or the, of the book or the story so those characters are they are they people you just don't like in your life that you yeah. put into the book <laughs> and then they always get beat beaten by the creature you know the creature eats them or electrocutes them or whatever yeah, no I, I i tell you what i, I don't know if it, we call it the cringe factor here but whenever I see people with like those, those sort of t-shirts, I'm like, I'm a writer. I'll put you in my story. I just like, oh, don't say that. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> like, um, you no, know, I just I like to think of interesting characters, um, and just how people can react. I mean, in in, in the morass, I've, I've got this two characters with competing goals, sort of traveling where, when they're they're abducted, and so you know, one of them is sort of wanting to go and find out. Um, she, 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 her grandfather passed away and he left this manuscript about how he always loved the country. And she goes out there to sort of, you know, write about essays on what country life is like. And, and then the other guy, he's in a band and obviously out back Australia, the, the country towns out there, there's, they're pretty dead. There's not a lot going on for a young person. Um, and he wants to play in a band and he's traveling to the city and these two kind of meet halfway when they come into trouble, I guess. Um, but in terms of what those characters are doing, I like to just think their own goals and, and what is it they're trying to achieve and how do these monstrous elements fit into that, I think, is is always interesting. And, and again, it comes, what are we saying about social issues, society, um, all those sorts of things, and, and how that can just be represented using something that's out of their control, I guess. Well, I was just, I was hoping to get some names here, of some people that you uh, killed in your book <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. tortured. You know, the monster came and yeah. and you know you know beat them and something, and it was like, well, that that's my mother. <laughs> she was a saint. She was a oh, saint. Well. So I wouldn't do that to mother, but um, no, yeah. <laughs> well, a neighbor or a teacher or something. Yeah, I'll tell you what. There are any noisy neighbors in my books? Who know it's about. Some guys we used to live next to. <laughs> yeah. See, there you go. Now we're getting it. Now, now, so the newest one, you newest story you've got out is called the Morris, the Morass. You know, and of course, I could have fun with that name. Yeah. Now, <laughs> servant of the fly god. Yes. Okay. So, how does that whole? I'm still really interested in that. How that develops, like you fly God, servant of the fly God. So this 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 morass is the servant, right? Yeah, of the God of flies. So where where does that come from? Are you like laying in your bedroom and looking at flies? And I, I, I it's pretty creative, is what I'm saying. And I just I, I couldn't imagine coming up with it. I think one of the things that it really comes from is sometimes you go to some of the the, the country towns away from the city and especially if they're like a cattle town and you probably experience the same over in, in the States or in Canada. And there's a lot of flies there <laughs> and, and they're so gross yeah. and annoying. <laughs> but, um, and just like, man, this is one thing that's kind of synonymous with this. I'm out here and it's like, I'm walking around, there's like 57 flies on my back. But, um, so I wanted to use some of those sorts of tropes, those, those sorts of things. Um, and as I said before, this, this started off as just a pretty kind of reductive, Yes, this is an Australian serial killer, and and he's a Mick Taylor clone. Um, and and when I sort of started to think about, well, what could be done with this? Why could he be doing this? I started to think about some of these ideas around, you know, like people who, I guess, the, the anti-science, the conspiracy theorists, this this kind of stuff that can lead into it, and and the idea that we've got some places where meteors have hit in Australia, and that was so long ago, and it's such this old, vast country, and I think. One of the things I'm sort of interested in is is the folk horror aspects of how people can sort of create their own sort of ideas and things. And so the the, the basic premise of it is this this killer he's basically become 
devoted to this creature he's been told lives in, in the, the morass or the swamp at the, the back of his house. And, and it, it came down with the meteors centuries ago, and it's just been there sort of waiting for an opportunity to make its next move on Earth. Um, and fortunately, it now has someone who can deliver what, what it needs. And, and this, this guy, Calvin Pastroni, the, the chief antagonist in the book, he, he's happy to work for it. And it's sort of one of the ways it, it has sort of corrupted the environment around it over time is by taking some of those, like those flies and using them as a hive mind kind of way of, surveilling and talking to things. And so they're able to sort of communicate in a way that they become an extension of the monster, that he treats them like pets and he sort of breeds them and collects them. And, you know, so he uses these things and then his own sort of predilections for torture and murder, he uses them to create a lot of body horror. And that idea for me definitely came from, I don't know if you've ever heard of the YouTuber Aussie Man Reviews. I used, no, I don't. He, he's kind of like this guy. He, he just com- commentates videos and, and puts a, like he, a really thick Australian accent on and makes them quite amusing and uses a lot of vernacular and colloquialism. Um, but I used to write the blog posts for, for him and the, the guys who were there every now and then they'd send through some of those, those videos, the, the meiosis videos where you'd see someone is infected you know, with a bot fly or they've just got tons of like maggots in their teeth. And I'd be like, can you stop sending me these videos? Cause they gross me out. I just do not like them. And, and they were just like, no, I felt like they sent me more after that because that's what blokes do. Right? Yeah, I was like, waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, yeah. And, and I would just watch them just being, this is just the most horrific thing I've ever seen. How can I use it in a book? <laughs> and so I sort of twisted all that in and, and, you know, so the characters are being, pretty much brutalized by the antagonist at this point. He wants to, in his words, prepare them for their sacrifice to this fly god that he's got out in the uh, swamp is how he sees it. Yeah, so that's where they came from. And it's it's pretty gross. It's wow. pretty gruesome. So, Do you take a lot of hallucinogenics? <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not at all. Um, yeah, it's quite really interesting. I was saying to uh, David before, uh, I'm actually a classroom teacher, and it... Um, so I'm, I'm I'm pretty straight. I'm a real, I'm a real family man. Um, so it's kind of funny because sometimes the kids would in class, but can we read your book? And I'm like, not that one. Uh, not that one either. <laughs> and, and, you know, like I sort of said to the, the publisher, Crystal Lake, I was like, look, just when you put this on Amazon, just, just definitely mark it as adult horror. Um, so, that, you know, there's no mistake if some parent sends an email like, oh my God, we read your book and it's not okay. Um, Wow. Like, well, you know, your child <laughs> you is 11. Why are they name? reading adult horror? You know, so. <laughs> yeah. You should have had a different name. You should have called yourself Dave Ashford or something. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to say, you know, do, do you worry about writing horror when, when, as a school teacher? No, it's it's never, ever been a problem. I mean, I've been teaching. I think most people are just genuinely a bit excited about it. And even for parents to be able to say, Oh, yeah, my kids teach as a writer. You know, it's, it's, it's nice. And I think parents enjoy that. And then the kids where I am, I'm, I'm at such a good school, such an academic school where it's kind of a selective entry school. So it's a real point for the kids to be like, Oh, yeah, this is great. And it, it it's like, does it actually <laughs> translate to what we're doing with curriculum? Maybe not necessarily, but it's a great point for them to, um, yeah. consider <laughs> so yeah are, are you the type of uh, writer that um when you're sitting down doing the story for instance are you seeing the action happen in your mind does it play like a movie do you hear characters do you when you're writing the dialogue does it does it come across as real like a real story then that way or are you completely just a technical writer that just does it on the paper like how how is your process in writing a story like this yeah great question um i guess my process is realistically a lot of planning um i like i like dialogue to sound natural so there's a lot of speaking dialogue out or reading to my wife um whether whether she wants to or not whether she's listening i'll just read with the expression on it but to come back, I, I i'm a big fan of just plotting it all out on a story curve or a free tax pyramid map and just actually putting it all together and making sure that it makes sense sequentially and there's tension in there. Um, and, and, and what I'll do though, when I first plot that is a lot of the nitty gritty won't be there, but the big set pieces will be. So I'll know that in something I'm writing, I want this scene to happen because it's, it's big and dynamic and I want this cool scene. And I really think about what 
would look amazing in um you know in some sort of visual and I'm I'm really picturing I'm quite a visual person. So yeah, what does it look like in you know, how does that come together? And then as I'm writing, I'll probably my first first few drafts won't even be complete. They'll just be having a go or getting things out, getting the characters down and maybe writing some of these pieces. And then I sort of always want to look back and say, well, okay, well, how did I get here? Like this is all well and good to say this looks really rad um, and good, but I can't just have random things happen. There's got to be a sequence. And then that's where it comes into, you know, what are the characters' goals, how they ended up here, you know, all these sorts of things. So it's really interesting, I think, when you start getting in, you go, okay, well, that doesn't work. I've got to redo that, you know. That sort of thing. So that's the process would be to draw it out. I take notes on characters and experiment with it. And even the first couple of readings, oh, this is a bit one-dimensional. How do I add more? How do I show, not tell something as opposed to just know it in my head, if that makes sense? Since you plot, mm. I'm wondering, do, do your characters surprise you? Do they do they kind of pull the, you know, the story off the rails a little bit, pull the plot out so that you know, you end up in, in a spot where you're like, how did I get here? And how do I get out of this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, there, there's sometimes, you, you know, you'll write something and you'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm really done. You know, I've got, got 2,000 words down today. You'll be feeling really good about yourself. And then when you go back a little bit later, you're like, well, why has this happened? Um, why have I written in here that this character did this? And it's because, you know, maybe I was being lazy in trying to bridge a gap somewhere. And that's when I've got to go back and, and flesh those things out. So that's the, I guess, the negative side of it. But I think the really positive side of it is, um, we actually had, uh, a, a, another author come and do a talk for the, um, children running a picture book. She's written like 80 books for kids and really talented lady, Josie Montano, um, came to our school and she was talking about how she actually interview her characters. And I was in a scene the other day writing a scene. I knew what I want to do with a character. And it just wasn't sort of happening. It all felt really contrived. But then by having them have a discussion with someone who's a mentor to them, that is kind of, you know, interrogating the, the character, it sort of came out the way I wanted it to. So there's that positive side of actually just writing this through within within the framework, writing this idea in a way that was free written actually helped unplug that kind of subconscious block, yeah. I think. Because um, I, I really... I really keep goals in mind when I'm writing for my characters, and I think that's the key to tension. You know, what are they trying to achieve? What's stopping them? You know, and even right. if it's simplistic at times, I just think that's that's the key to turning pages. Well, yeah, and and uh, the whole concept of it. Do you do you actually create like the cover when you get a cover like of your newest book? Mm. Is it you that created that cover or? the idea of it oh. uh, with someone or like how, how does that come about? This one, I was really, really lucky. Um, it was Ben Baldwin, who is just an incredible, incredible cover designer. I think he won a world fantasy award or British fantasy award a, a couple of years ago for one of his covers. And I was I'm lucky enough that uh, one of my previous books, when the cicadas stop singing, or cicadas, as you guys say over there, stop singing. He designed that. And when, uh, Joe at Crystal Lake said, oh, we can, we can get Ben Baldwin on this for you. You've worked with him before. Ben actually came and said, I, I really loved the last book. I read I read this one too, and um, I've got some great ideas. What do you want? And I sort of gave him a, this brief idea. You know, I have this idea of the monster coming out of the water, the, the characters in the foreground, but I am not a visually uh, capable artist. You know, I'm the kind of guy who will draw a frog, and someone's like, what is that blob? <laughs> you know, so... Yeah. Um, I was able to sort of just send him an email saying, I think this, but I don't know if it would work. Would it work? And he's like, give me, give me a couple of days to play with it. And he comes back and he's like, what do you think of this? And I'm just like, dude, like, this is incredible. Just basically go nuts. The, the thing I did sort of put forward was I want it to be able to sit next to the previous one at, at a convention table, you know, these are, these are these books. And cause they're both very much set in Queensland, which is, is where I live. And I, I, I really like the idea of keeping that theme going and the, the covers, they have their similarities in the way there's like, you know, the, the tree line and, and, and the composition of them, but the colors are so contrasting. It looks really, really interesting when you put them together. So yeah. And that gives us a really good representation of what Queensland looks like. Yeah. The monsters and, um, lizard people. <laughs> that's. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was just like, well, that's that's really good. You should send these book covers to the uh, marketing of Queensland, you know, like uh, when they're out trying to get 
tourists around the, the world. Yeah, you, you've you've heard about our spiders. Now have a look at this thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come to Queensland. Yeah, yeah, I could see it now. Yeah, I'm sure it'll work. What was it? <laughs> way, way better than throwing a shrimp on the barbie, right? Was it was it Paul Hogan? Oh, he yeah. Was a tax dodger? That was the thing, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're frying it right in front of the swamp and the big creature come to eat, yeah. eats there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, can I have some? What was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Need so, a big knife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now, see, now we're getting somewhere. Now yeah. we're getting yeah. a real thing going on here. See? Make some money on the side. What makes a good story for you? What is it that, 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 keeps you or what is it that that you find in a story that kind of goes wow i like this and you kind of will even read it again like any story with no matter the genre it's it's the people isn't it you know um what's the emotional resonance yeah. what's what's gripping about what's happening to them even if it's not something i can relate to on a personal level just this idea that human beings are experiencing this conflict and and the way we sort of get involved with that and, and the dramas of that you know i think that's what makes it look good for me i mean I think we've all read um, books that are just sort of set pieces and action. Well, we don't really care too much about the characters and they're, they're just mindless fun and there's a place for that. But something that I'm going to walk away from going, yeah, that, that was, was actually quite powerful in terms of the way it elicited that emotive response from me. It's always about the people involved and, and why this matters to them, you know, so that yeah. kind of... Have you, have you written a character in the past that stays with you today, like that that you find intriguing like one of your favorite characters let's say in in all of the stories you've written is there one that kind of sticks out for you yeah i, th I think definitely and it's probably got a lot to do with the way it's a single perspective um story but cora and when the scatters stop singing i think she's this really interesting complex character because um she's living out in the um the hinterland as she's surviving you know this this post-apocalyptic um, world um, and one of the things that she's sort of she's become attached to this place she's buried her son there who's died and she doesn't want to leave so the, the main conflict of the story is not the lizard monsters themselves it's the people who who come and try to take this this secure kind of base from her so it sort of plays it like a home invasion but her, you know it's that, that why didn't you just run away what do you have to let go of and what does it mean to actually process grief um, and I think that subconsciously I was working through some some things that in my life when I was running around that time were, were there. My mum had recently passed and then there were some family things going on where I well, wasn't seeing people anymore and it was this kind of this exercise in being, okay, well, I, I, I want to stick with this but I have to move on. And so her fighting for her right to stay and then perhaps realising that maybe she did have other options after all, or even if she did fight and win that battle, maybe staying wasn't the best thing. And and, and I think that is quite resonant in, oh, here comes my cat, uh, I'm quite resonant in um, <laughs> just being a character that sticks with me there. I think that was really important. And then, yeah, I, I don't know, like, and I, it's those things that I didn't think I'm going to work this stuff out. But when I read it, read it back and, and sort of had to put some yeah. stuff together because it was, it was nominated for the Orealis here in Australia. And I had to think, oh, God, if I have to go and stand there afterwards. And I didn't, fortunately, have to um, explain anything to anyone. So the book just gets <laughs> it's done its own. Yeah, to think about what was going on in my head when I wrote that. And I think that's a really interesting way to look back at it. Yeah, yeah I don't know if well, that you makes You kind sense. of look like her on the cover, too. Yeah, I know, right? I'm like, I've got this long, these long locks of hair, and you know, clean shaven. The, the way I yeah. hold an axe is to pretty tough too. So yeah. Well, I thought that would. Isn't that how you go to school? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, teacher. Oh, here he comes. Yeah. <laughs> What's he going to teach yeah. us? <laughs> Mister uh, Ashford yeah. always carries an axe. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Be... Well, no, it, and that's kind of one question I ask because it seems like, and even in myself, you know, when you talk to writers. Um, quite often each time they go through a project, write a story and it, and it gets published and, or they, and they finish and they move on. That process of that story, such as the, the cicada stop singing when the, when they stop singing that, that book. So that the writing of that story actually changed you somewhat. And I always ask when, what, what, what it does or how it changes you and uh that one you kind of talked about how about the new one did it did you notice any any changes in 
in who you are, even as a writer, now that it's complete? Probably not so much. I mean, I think in the way that this was put together as a novella, I finished it after I had finished writing the novel I'd written, which definitely was a big exercise. And I kind of wanted a, a bit of a palate cleanser in this one as well. So just what what can horror be in terms of what I can write and how horrific can I actually make it? Um, there were these kind of things here. Um, but in terms of a big personal, a, a big personal character arc, I guess, probably not so much. Um, I think it let me process a few things about like traveling because there's that, these kinds of elements of things, but I don't know. That it, I don't think so. Not this one so much. Yeah. It's more of a traditional also to the wall horror story. And yeah, like I think even editing back when I, when I had to read it again and I, I got to the end of this one, I went, oh man, that's really kind of breathless by the end. It's uh, this relentless sort of horror as opposed to the, the right. character arc. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. But I, you know, I wonder, you know, when you, when you were doing this, you were probably writing this over the pandemic, I would imagine. Yeah, it would have been, was it? And so do you think that sort of harshly the reason you wanted it as well? Not only a palate cleanser, but um, just letting aggression out, and and you know, also with you know all the weird stuff going on. Yeah, I think yeah, actors and all that. that. That's a really good insight. Yeah. I think, I think to an extent, when I was finishing both of these books, and and they're both pretty bleak. The books coming out this year, I was in a pretty angry kind of place, um, just with with various things that that are going on in in, in your personal life, right. you know. And I'm not like oh, why is me kind of thing, but just some bits and pieces that are happening and a bit of turmoil in other places, you know, with family members and things like that. And to be able to sort of be like, okay, well, uh, well, geez, I'm pissed off this year. And I look at this book like, you know, it, it's quite visceral. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe it was about just processing some of those darker emotions and whether it was a case of actually being cognizant of what they mean subjectively or whether it was just a case of, no, you're just in a grumpy phase and this book reflects that. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I know if I was writing it, the um, people getting killed by the monster would be like the anti-vax. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, it, it's, but that's me. <laughs> yeah. It, it's more interesting that I think, it, look, that, that, that was top of my mind uh, through a lot of the time is the whole anti-vax kind of movement and, and how it's doing harm. And I guess there is that to it because it is. The character Calvin Pastroni is very much a conspiracy theorist. Like one of the lines he sort of says in the books, um, we have the CSIRO over here. Well, we did until politicians decided science doesn't matter. And they sort of, you know, were, were funded. And one of the things he says is when, when he's saying to these characters when he, before he abducts them, look, you know, I'm going to show you the meteors. I'm going to show you the meteors. And, and the, the guys are like, you know, that's bull. Oh my. There's no meteors. It's literally just a myth. Right. Um, and it's just volcanic activity that's left these these caves and swamps and things here. He's like, oh, you don't believe those science wankers, do you? And, and so there, there is that element. And then I, I'm kind of often really thinking about the ways religion can be used for negative purposes. And I think we see this a lot. And, and I, I don't actually think they're the religious people who are making these things where it's, look, we're going to go out and actively kind of be harmful because we think it's good. I think they're people who are taking advantage of religion to meet their own agendas. And I think people who actually really are faithful in what they believe are, you know, are not thinking along these lines. But I think it's very easy to manipulate that and say, well, I've got money and power and I'm doing this in the name of this and you should join me. I think that's a pretty seductive message for a lot of people um, because it appeals to our kind of baser attributes. I think there's an element of that coming through in Pastroni and the Fly God. You know, they they talk about wanting to cleanse the earth of sinners a little bit. So I think there's definitely some of that subconscious aspect coming through. So maybe that's something I was kind of frustrated about through COVID now that I'm a bit more um, thinking about it on a deeper level. So thanks for asking me that, actually. Yeah, I always think uh, on those terms. Usually you can you can find the, the source, you know, in that way. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, because you, you might not plan um any sort of a meaning or subtext in the beginning but it sort of comes out organically when you're writing yeah, I agree right? completely. When you're putting the story together it sort of just works out and then you can look back at it and you can be editing or re redoing it and you realize there's more to it than just a a, a simple monster 
you know, t- killing people. Yeah, you know? I agree. Absolutely. Um, you know. Yeah. If you ever read any of Dave's books, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to do it, actually. I always make a point to them. That's <laughs> so uh, now, so where, where are you going to, what do you plan to do with your writing world? Have you had any thoughts about what you want to do and where you want to see it go? Uh, I think, look, I, I kind of think of, of this as, as a hobby. There, there's a part of me that I would love to find ways to, um, angle this passion I have for writing into career aspects. But I don't think the reality is that you can just sell books and do that. I think you have to be involved in teaching and workshops and editing and those kind of things as well to realistically take it to a place where you can call it a career, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And I think I'd like to over the next, you know, 18 months or so, do some further study and I'll know I've got some, some access to where I've, I've studied. Um, some of the professors there would be happy to take me on board to do some things there. I'd love to do that because that's an opportunity we, we're afforded here in Australia. Um, and then use that, you know, for, for tutoring and, and further studies. Um, but really I think what I, what I want is I just want people to read my books and enjoy them and, that's pretty much it, you know. Like, obviously, we all we, we would all love to have movies made and make millions of dollars, but I think the, the reality is you have to be kind of a bit pragmatic in how you think about those things. Right. And yeah, I think for me, just to be recognised as you know, this is this is this is of a reasonably good quality, and and he's not just wasting his time; he's he's writing good stuff, and people who enjoy horror can read it and go, yeah, this is, this is good horror if that makes sense. So it's about quality within that niche field. Um, I'd love to perhaps look at how I could bring in some of the um, the young adult middle grade approaches to fiction and, and do some horror with that. I think that's that's an area that is um, ripe for exploration. Because when you give kids in class a story, even something like The Monkey's Paw, they just love it. And um not too many of the books we present them with as, as educators are of that nature, but when you give them those stories, they're, they're firmly engrossed in them and they love, you know, series and things like that. So I'd love to do something like that. Um, how? Yeah, it's not really crossed my mind yet. Yeah, I think that, so that really it's I just, just like... Just sleep with the right people. Just and... <laughs> sleep with the right people. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you know anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that's how I get anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got to brush those knees off. Eh? <laughs> oh, they're just permanent. I got permanent braces on them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I was just wondering, we, we have a robust uh, horror community here in the States. What about Australia? Oh, do you have a horror community there as well? Yeah, it's it's amazing um, how how strong it is. I think when I mean, you think about it on a population base level compared to a big place like like the states, you know, I think we've got what twenty seven million, something like that, maybe thirty million. I'm not sure exactly yeah. what the figures are. Um, and the, the first time I went down to a convention in Canberra, um, it was for the Orialis, and you walk into this room, and it, you know, there's Karen Warren, Aaron Dries, Alan Baxter. You know, um, Garth Nix, all these like name authors, and you're like, oh my god, they're all like here in Australia, and it's ever like you know, uh, Jean Flynn lives up the road, and she's won, you know, how many Stokers, and you know, and 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 that pool of really high quality authors, um, all being here, I think is pretty interesting because it's not something I really thought about before. You know, we all mention, you know, we know authors from our country and these kind of things, but when you're actually seeing them all there together, you're like, oh, this is actually a bit of a powerhouse room um, in terms of who's, right. who's, who's there. And, you know, I think that's, I think, I think we punch way above our weight here in Australia when it comes to horror fiction. So, so now let's see. Uh, now, are you active on social media? Do you like uh, readers and people to find you on uh, different places? Do you have a website? Yeah, yeah. Where do people find Zachary? Like hanging out at a bar? Like what's going on? Where <laughs> With any luck. Um, no, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, social media. I mean, social media is tricky to say where to start these days because it's just fragmenting and exploding and who knows what's going on. Um, I guess yeah. the, the, the first easy starting point is, is the website, Zachary-Ashford.com. We'll take you there. Um, no, I need to update it, to be honest. But as much as I hate to say it, Twitter is probably still where I have the most followers um, and I can reach the most people. And once you hit there, it can drive you to, you know, the other places. Um, I do get involved yeah. in, you know, um, Facebook groups, like the Books of Horror group on Facebook, which 
is this really awesome group of the best thing on Facebook. I think these days, um, you know, you see so many recommendations for great horror books and, and things on there. I think it's really, you know, great to have that on there. Uh, so I try and participate in that as much as I can. Twitter is probably the easiest point to then go, right, you know, this yeah. is publicly available. Here it is. And then, you know, there's links on there to yeah. everywhere else is probably the easiest thing to say. Well, you got to get on TikTok. And, oh, yeah. You know, I, I, nothing makes me feel my age like TikTok. And it's not even the videos. Yeah. I was talking to, I was talking to someone the other day and like, I said, can you share this post? And I'm just like, totally a boomer. Like, how do I share a, a TikTok? You know, is there a, is there a <laughs> verb for sharing a TikTok? I don't know. Like you retweet something on, on Twitter, but uh, doesn't it just send a difference? Well, that's there? X now. Yeah. I know. Yeah, right. That's yeah. It's X. Oh not God. Twitter. It's X. Yeah. As, as any 14 year old would name their website. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of been done before. Yeah, it's, right. Okay. It's, um, yeah, yeah, it is what it's saying. So. Uh, I meant X, not Twitter. Yeah. Oh, God, you yeah. just feel like a loser <laughs> saying it, don't you? Could you imagine walking into that meeting yeah. with your shareholders and being like, all right, guys, so I've got this great idea. And, and they're like, I don't know, I guess in this, in this context, they'd probably be like, what now? But, yeah, I, I could just imagine the faces. And he's like, yeah, big grin, how good is this idea? And they're like... Oh, it's great, Elon. It's great. <laughs> it's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I am on there. I, I think a lot of writers left there. Yeah, Twitter's, Twitter's a, a strange place. Or X is a strange place these days compared to what it was yeah. a year ago. Well, we really appreciate you being on the show, and it's been interesting. It's good, good talk with you. Um, now, of course, your latest story is called The Morass, and it's the Servant of the fly god and it's uh zachary ashford you know he's the author here and uh thank you for being on the show thanks so much for having me i really appreciate it it's a really you know great start of the weekend i feel productive and flattering so thanks so much for having me really appreciate it thanks zachary you've been listening to the house of mystery radio show to find out more about our guests hosts or shows go to www.com houseofmystery.com Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.